Good morning. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm Kelly LeCount, PCI's Education and Training Manager. On behalf of PCI, I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's webinar, a case study judging the feasibility of purchasing a new powder coating system, presented by Nick Liberto of Powder Coating Consultants. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that all attendees are on mute, so if you have any questions along the way, please type them in the question panel. Nick will address all questions at the end of the webinar. If we happen to run out of time, there will also be contact information on the closing slide for you to send your questions. PCI will be sure to provide you with any additional information you need. This webinar is being recorded and will be available through the PCI store within two business days. All attendees will receive a brief survey after the webinar. Please take a few moments and reply to the survey. We greatly appreciate your feedback as PCI continues to develop new programs and webinars to offer the topics and training that you need. Now I'd like to introduce the presenter for today's webinar. Nick Liberto is the president of Powder Coating Consultants, a division of Nina Inc., an independent technical consulting firm located in Estero, Florida. Nick has provided technical consultation for hundreds of companies worldwide in the powder coating industry. He's been in the industry since 1980. Nick holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering with a minor in Physics and is a registered professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. He's a member of several trade associations and serves on technical trade and standards committees for these organizations. He's a contributor to PCI's Powder Coating, The Complete Finisher's Handbook, and written several articles for Powder Coated Tough Magazine. Nick has previously held various sales, marketing, and technical positions for powder application and recovery equipment companies. Nick, thank you for being here today. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today's session. Um, hopefully you walk away with some information you didn't know before. Uh, this is a topic I've, speaking, I've spoken on frequently in the past. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna shut off my uh, uh, camera uh, and stick to uh, the presentation that's before you. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, the uh, um, feasibility of um, uh, purchasing a, a powder coating process and judging its feasibility. And what you'll notice um, in the very first slide here, there's not a tremendous difference uh, between a powder coating project and any other capital project in a manufacturing environment. Those of you who've been through manufacturing uh, ap uh, acquisition programs will notice, hey, these are similar concepts and, and methodologies that we use when we go out and buy uh, large scale capital equipment uh, for other areas of your facility. And that's because when you look at it, you know, powder coating is not much different from any other capital project, at least from a, a, a top level uh, position. And as in all capital projects, management has simple uh, questions that often take some time and effort. And we say, we say simple questions with complicated answers. Uh, so what are these questions that management looks at when they look at capital projects, including powder coating systems? Well, they typically wanna know what options are available to accomplish a process. Uh, there's always several ways of getting there. And they just wanna be sure that a good amount of due diligence has been executed to ensure that you've evaluated all the possible options that make sense, those that are and determine what is, what is feasible from those options and present those options in, in a cogent manner in a compare and contrast method. So they also wanna know what the system costs. That's the CapEx purchase price, of course. Uh, they also wanna know how much floor space it's gonna take uh, to put this new system in the plant. Uh, they typically want to know what the impact of a new powder coating process or any CapEx project is going to have on, in, on manpower or staffing requirements. How many people does it take to operate this system? Of course, they want to know what the effects on operating costs are going to be. Uh, how much does it cost uh, and how much will that affect your, your uh, individual product cost? Uh, does it make your product more or less expensive? Uh, eventually, uh, once you have your your uh, system cap capex pricing and costing and your operating costing and compare it to uh, a current method let's say that you may be finishing your project you can determine a return on investment or payback for that capital investment and that's again very typical of any capex project 
So the answer to these simple questions will determine if the project is approved, delayed, or canceled. Uh, and so this is where we'll be focusing our efforts in this presentation. So what makes it unique for, for a powder coating situation is how do we apply these you know, uh, standard manufacturing uh, acquisition principles to a powder coating situation? Uh, and how do we evaluate uh, um, um, uh, uh, the, the options that are necessary and presented to management? Well, uh, we wanna make sure the process is big enough. What does that mean? Can it handle the number of products and the size of the products you need to coat? Uh, will the process provide enough part, uh, provide, excuse me, uh, parts that meet your customer's expectation? That's all about the performance of the coating on your product. Um, and we'll get into this, each one of these separately, by the way. Uh, will the finishing process integrate in your manufacturing process? That's a key point. Uh, a paint system or powder coating system in particular uh, it's not an island into itself. It's another manufacturing process. It has to be able to integrate typically between fabrication and assembly uh, or shipping, and it has to do that well. Uh, what technical options are available? As we said, there's always several ways of getting there. And will the process meet your uh, payback and, uh, uh, and ROI targets, return investment uh, targets? And a feasibility study is, is a methodology that will provide the answers in a compare and contrast method uh, to management so that these uh, answers can be provided uh, and management can allocate funds and appropriate uh, uh, manpower and other things to support the project moving forward. Well, let's talk about some of the unique things that uh, involve finishing systems, distinguishing this process from another manufacturing process. Well, what goes into finishing system design? Basically, three broad categories of information uh, and analysis go into that finishing system design. One has to do with coating performance issues. What do you expect the coating to do on your product and for how long? Uh, part and production issues, basically size and dimensions and volumes, how, how many parts per unit time you need to produce. And plant-specific issues, you know, can it fit my plant? Are there specific things about my plant that will impact uh, the design of the finishing system. And again, we will look at these individuals. So the first thing we'll look at is part and production issues. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Well, how do we go about right sizing a powder coating? Well, it's, you have to make sure that the system after you get it installed uh, is capable of achieving your production goals both now and for some foreseeable time in the future. And as we said, these paint lines can last an awful long time. Uh, we've been in facilities that have paint lines that are 30 to 50 years old. So these are truly items that can be around for a long time. So you want to make sure your finishing process here in the middle of this manufacturing diagram uh, is sized to what fabrication can send it and what assembly or shipping needs to complete its operations. So it's important that we spend the time right here figuring out what that is. So what is that based on? It's based on the total parts that need to be coded per unit time. Uh, and the finishing system has to be right sized to keep pace. As we said, the results of the right sizing affects process options. If the system gets too big, some options fall away. Uh, if it's uh, too small, there's other options that fall away. If the right sizing calculations come out to a, a lower value. Although some companies may not be able to accurately predict what happens, there's always some limitations you have to consider. Uh, you know, uh, people who are in the job shop business, I don't know what's coming in from the day to day there's gonna be some limitations that impact how you're gonna proceed with this program. It may be floor space impact, it may be, hey, I can't get products any bigger than this through other parts of my line, or other parts of my process, uh, so therefore that's the limitation. So generally, uh, uh, you know, everyone has a limitation of some sort, maybe CapEx driven for that matter. Uh, so moving on, we're gonna actually show how that works here. All right. Uh, here's an example of how you go about right-sizing a process. This is extremely simplified. Uh, we actually uh, have a math model that does this on a much more uh, um, uh, prolific basis, if you will, and you'll see some results of that in the case study at the end of the presentation. So generally, this is looking at a simple uh, uh, project, something uh, I believe it was a lawnmower uh, facility, and, and this facility runs several parts to make up the lawnmowers. They have both rider lawnmowers and, and standard push types, but so the push types have things like 
uh, handles and the, uh, and the riders have seats, for instance. So those are a little different. They have some product sizing, okay, these are in inches. Uh, and uh, they have some product or production volumes here. So one has to think about, based upon these product size, what kind of window you're going to use to hold these products on the line. Typically the window is sized around the largest part or some uh, volume of that largest part, so say three of your largest parts. And that window now needs to be filled to a certain density with smaller parts. And that's what this example is kind of showing. We take the uh, parts per hanger based upon uh, uh, how many parts we can fit in this window. We figure out how much space on the line uh, that particular hanger will, will take. And that's a, a, a function of uh, the, uh, 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 the size of the hanger and how much space you need between it to execute, let's say, coding on the side of the part or loading uh, ergonomic situation is to be considered. So that's the space, uh, you know, kind of between the part. And when you take uh, uh, that, you figure out what the uh, what the centers are. And the centers are shown basically based upon the part window uh, dimension here, plus the space equals the part centers. Okay, and that's effectively how much space this window takes up on the line. Uh, and then how do we take that information to determine the right size and calculation? Well, it's quite simple. We take your, your volume of parts here. This is an annual quantity in this case. We divide it out by the parts per hanger on the line, okay? And then we take that and uh, multiply it by the part centers here. Okay, we'll take this one here. And we come up with so many hangers per year, basically, by taking the parts uh, annual volume, divide it by the parts per hanger, gives us so many hangers per year. We take the hangers per year, multiply it by the part centers, and come up with how much linear feet of conveyor needs to be processed in that period of time, in this case, a year. Uh, uh, to produce that volume. And so uh, we simply sum up all those different uh, 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 space accommodations for all the different parts. And in this case, it's 2,600,000 linear feet of conveyor per year. And, and that's the basis of a production analysis to determine how much conveyor space is required to run your parts. Well, how do we go and convert that uh, conveyor space into line speed? Again, some pretty simple math. We have to figure out how much time we have available because the design line speed is what we call a numerator denominator calculation. Very simple. We have the conveyor length on the numerator and we have the available production time in the denominator. So we start out with available time and that's in this case, seven hours a day, 60 minutes an hour. It's gonna be operating two shifts and 300 operational days per year. So it breaks down to 252,000 minutes per year. And that would go right here in the bottom. But that by itself, it doesn't represent what happens in a paint line. A paint line, especially in a power coating operation, you have to have so much time available to execute color change. You have to have so much time to run rework. As much as we like to think we're, our process is gonna be perfect moving forward, we have to put a, a value in there for running some rework. In this case, we use 3%. Uh, sometimes this is also called uptime or utilization time. And then we have to have some uh, a, a factor to uh, consider additional production uh, for the future. We're looking at today's numbers. There may be a growth factor uh, that one has to consider. In this case, we're using 3% for this example. So in the numerator here, here's the number from the previous uh, slide. We put in 2.6 uh, uh, million linear feet of conveyor. We adjust that number by 11%, and that's what the addition of 5% plus uh, three and three gives us 11% here. So we add 11% of adjustments, and that's in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we divide it by the available time, which was calculated here. And we come up with feet per minute, and in this case, it's 11.44 feet per minute. Of course, you wouldn't buy a system for 11.44 feet per minute. You'd buy it for 12 feet per minute. Uh, but at least get you in the ballpark of what you need to know uh, starting out. Well, how do you determine whether that uh, uh, calculation on right sizing the process is going to be a, uh, pertinent for either a conveyorized system or a batch system or some kind of combination? Well, normally, in our experience, we found that any system that that calculation determines a line speed of, of less than six feet per minute, uh, it seems typically is much more efficient uh, to size a system using either a batch or indexing process. A uh, batch process, of course, you physically move products from 
uh, from step to step through that. There's not a con conveyor connecting these things. It may even be a push-pull conveyor, but you physically move the parts through the steps. Indexing line, by the way, is pretty much the same thing, except you use a power conveyor to do the, the same operation, where basically a, a chain conveyor stops the product in each process step, and the, the process is executed at that step, and after a predetermined period of time, the uh, conveyor actuates to the next step and indexes to that step, and the next process is uh, actu uh, actuated. So uh, if it's less than six feet per minute, we look at uh, typically a, a batch or indexing system. Uh, we've also seen situations where just because of product size and how you have to manage the process, a combination system would make sense where you have both uh, uh, some maybe some batch operations for some things uh, and a conveyorized operation for others. And what we've seen work are things like having uh, you know batch systems used for pretreatment and cleaning of the products prior to the coating. And we use conveyorized operations for either spraying operations and curing operations. And, and, and that seems to be a pretty, uh, pretty normal way as well, of kind of having the best of both worlds. Well, on a batch system, you have to right size that as well. And that's not, you know, once you go through the calculation of line speed and the production analysis, you have to figure out how do you size the batch system. And that's a machine loading analysis, basically, for those of you folks in the manufacturing engineering world, and you've probably done some some uh, machine uh, loading analyses. Uh, we use a, a, a project management program, this is Microsoft Project, uh, to pretty much do that. And it's just a way to assign resources, and it, resources could be people, which are shown in this column, uh, or equipment, uh, and it's also shown in that column. So what we look at is we look at the different steps. We have to, for, for instance, load a part, we have to pre-treat a part, uh, dry it, cool it, uh, coat it, cure it, cool it down again, and then unload it. And each one of these process steps has a time. And, that, and during that time, when that step's being executed, uh, another process batch can't be started. So we have to you know, see what the impact is as we go through uh, the various batches. So we look at this and we say, okay, the first batch, every, all the equipment's available and all the equipment, there's no wait time for anything. Uh, everything is executed straightforwardly. Uh, the next batch, things start going a little out of sync, as we see here. We're waiting for the cure oven because the cure oven cycle is 30 minutes long and much longer than everything that happens before it. So it's still curing the first batch, not available for the second batch. And that's the wait time that's reflected here. Wait time is not a problem unless you cannot produce the number of batches per day uh, or per unit time that you're evaluating. And so what we look at here is that you see this oven time now it gets extended even longer by the time you get to the third batch. Well, what we're looking at here is can you accomplish the number of batches per unit time, per day in this case, to, uh, uh, to deliver the number of parts you have? And then you can determine how many parts go into that batch uh, uh, or vice versa. So you can say, okay, if I got 10 parts per batch and I only got to do 30 parts per day, and I can easily do that as shown by, the, by this analysis, then even though I'm waiting for ovens, uh, in this case a cure oven, uh, it doesn't really impact my ability to do three batches per day to get my 30 parts because I'm going to do 10 parts per batch. And, and that's the evaluation one does on the right sizing of batch systems. Okay, so that's pretty much all the right sizing stuff, uh, how big the system needs to be. And, uh, and we'll talk about how that impacts capital pricing. It certainly impacts floor space based on the size of the equipment. But the next thing to talk about here is how do those finishing performance requirements affect capital procurement of powder coating systems? Well, generally you have to meet certain standards and specifications when you make your product. Some industries in the construction industry, for instance, have uh, their own set of specifications. Architectural elements have theirs, medical devices, this kind of thing. And you know, certainly the military components have them. So your particular specifications that require the process steps to be executed uh, in this new finishing line are going to be dictated by what you're doing. And there's going to be unique specifications from uh, driven by customers or particular uh, areas of industry you're servicing. There may be warranty statements you're trying to achieve with the coding on your process. That's the whole idea about performance, by the way. And just as an anecdote, we only coat things for two purposes. 
We code it to change how it looks. Those would be appearance properties. And we code it to improve its uh, performance over a period of time, to let it survive for a longer period of time. That applies to our houses, for instance, our cars, our automobiles, of course, and, and any parts that we make. Uh, and you have to determine a balance between how much is important about the appearance versus the performance, because that affects how a system is configured. So this determines process steps. So you have a warranty statement you have to achieve. Uh, and so uh, it may be a corrosion performance standard. It may have to do with uh, appearance. Uh, you know, your, your corrosion standard I, you know, may be tied to a time dur duration. Things like my product must last at least 15 years in the field. Well, it all starts out with what the product starts looking like initially, what you expect it to look like at the end of its life, understanding what that product life is, understand if there's any maintenance required or that you expect the customer to perform to that product to keep it looking that way, okay? Because that affects things as well. So all that determines, you know, what you have to do to this product to in fact uh, um, um, get a good coating on it. Oh, there's another good important thing to mention here. Uh, different powder coating manufacturers offer extended warranties, especially in the architectural market, market where warranties for coating performance may exceed or be uh, uh, provided for up to 30 years product life. And they have to be in a, you know, the people who do that kind of coating have to be accredited by those, those formulators. Uh, uh, and uh, that requires a certain amount of process steps to, to get to that. And, and that uh, coating process needs to be approved uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, accepted by the powder coating formula to achieve that guarantee. Well, how do we get there? Uh, how do we get to coating performance? Let's do with the coating design. And the coating design is really a function of several things. It's a function of, first off, what substrate you're starting with. Okay, different substrates have different performance by themselves. For instance, steel has certain survivability in a corrosion-rich environment, but it's not as good as aluminum. Aluminum is a much more corrosion prevention, uh, 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 corrosion uh, performing substrate than steel is and of course stainless steel is even better than that so we start out with the substrate we improve the performance of that substrate by applying a conversion coating in most cases some systems if they have a very low corrosion standard and they don't have to achieve high corrosion performance they may not have a conversion coating on there some systems have a primer to achieve a certain coating performance other ones don't it depends upon again what the uh, standard you're trying to achieve and the top coat provides that those good appearance standards you're looking to achieve and uh, other mechanical properties like scratch resistance. So how you get there is a, as a function of the entire package here, what we call the coating package. And some of the properties may be available from the substrate, some are available, some are achieved by uh, uh, conversion coatings, uh, such as iron phosphate and zirconium and, and those kind of things. Some are achieved by primers and those applications that require it and some are achieved by the, uh, the top coat. So the entire package is what gets you there. Let's see if we can erase these, uh, these marks and move on to the next screen. Okay, so how does that affect system design? Well, coating performance determines the number of steps that must be executed. For instance, the number of stages in the cleaning and pretreatment system. It also includes the number of coatings that may be applied, like we said, whether it's a primer top coat package or if there's multiple top coats applied for things like dielectric strength. Uh, coating performance can also drive system complexity, complexity quite a bit. Uh, that means things like, well, I may have to combine different technologies like eco primers and powder top coats or powder primers and liquid top coats to achieve, achieve certain uh, coating performance requirements. It may require a special uh, uh, substrate preparation, uh, such as having products galvanized or plated prior to coating. It may impact your wastewater requirements, uh, and, and that's dictated by the substrates, especially things like galvanized products. Uh, some of that zinc is going to be precipitated off that part when it goes through the cleaning process, and you're going to accumulate that in your wastewater stream. And you're going to be, um, and since zinc is considered a heavy metal, you have to manage uh, the effluent coming off that process. So those are things that uh, are affected by coating performance. Uh, the last part of the puzzle, as we said, that goes into finishing design is plant-specific issues. And, and what are things that would limit uh, the procurement or design of a powder coating system that are specific to a plant? 
Well, things like overhead access, uh, uh, overhead door access. If you have a very small door requiring uh, equipment to be broken down in very small chunks, uh, that needs to be understood right away, okay? Uh, plant environment. If you have a very dirty uh, uh, plant environment and you're trying to put on a very uh, high quality, high appearance coating, there's some steps in the process or a piece of equipment that need to be procured to protect the coating operation from the surrounding plant environment. There may be some building construction limitations. Things like your floor slab issues may limit you to how much load you can transfer to the floor uh, to either support products on a conveyor or support heavy equipment like pretreatment systems and washers that contain solution tanks. Uh, there may be environmental contamination issues. This was something we ran across with a client. Uh, that prevented them from doing any excavation in the plant. So we couldn't put trenches around the washer in that particular installation because the, uh, the dirt under the plant uh, uh, concrete floor was considered contaminated, could not be disturbed. So that's something that, that comes up once in a while. It could be roof support issues. This has to do, again, how you support the conveyor. Uh, some conveyors can be supported from the roof of your facility if your uh, roof can handle that additional loading. Uh, that may be, uh, most people are limited by the support from the roof and have to transfer that weight and load to the floor. Uh, and if a product, a, a process is going to be uh, uh, put into a mezzanine environment, a second floor issue, or some sections of the process are included in that mezzanine, that's obviously impacted by what the mezzanine can handle as far as weight. Okay, uh, other plant limitations, utility limitations. Most people have good and sufficient electrical supply, uh, but uh, it's good, good to mention. Um, uh, natural gas uh, is the preferred energy source for most of the heating operations and the powder coating operation, uh, except for electric IR. Uh, and if one doesn't have natural gas available, you have to look at other alternatives, which can be problematic, such as propane. Uh, and propane, for instance, It'll work as well as natural gas, but you have to store that on site. And depending upon how much natural gas you're going to consume and operate in your process, that may be somewhat infeasible to do. Uh, sewer. If you don't have a good place to discharge your wastewater, uh, then uh, you have to consider other, other options like storing it on site and maybe having somebody truck it off or evaporate it or try to look at some water polishing systems to reuse and recycle as much of the water as possible. There are no systems out there that are 100% zero discharge. Uh, the people who sell them even honestly talk about that. Uh, you can polish it to maybe 80 or 90% total volume, but there's still 10 to 20% you have to get rid of. So if you don't have a good sewer system available to discharge wastewater, you have to look at some other things. Your incoming fresh water. Uh, if you were using well water, for instance, for your facility and not city water, uh, there may be some uh, 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 problems on the quality of that water, you know, things like, um, you know, chlorides and, and heavy, uh, you know, uh, and metal content, uh, uh, hardness and this kind of things that will affect the performance of the product and or the chemistries used to pretreat those products. And you have to look at ways to mitigate those issues. Compressed air, well, most coatings require clean, dry air. And if you don't have it, that needs to be included, of course. Air emissions, some municipalities have very low limits. Uh, those of you on the West Coast, typically California, have an air quality management board that you have to live with. And typically their limits are lower than national standards. Uh, typically, uh, uh, actually most states have standards that are lower than uh, uh, national standards. And then we have the old local authority having jurisdiction, the LAHJ. Uh, they typically control things like safety, code compliance, and permit issues, and also the insurance company, FM inspectors, et cetera. All this impacts uh, uh, equipment design and how you position equipment in the plant. Maybe you have to have some things outside uh, in certain areas. So sometimes those are difficult to predict. I think we'll talk about that in the next slide here. How do these affect system design? As we said, the access limits uh, uh, and having a big enough uh, door to fit the equipment in means you basically have to break the equipment down into smaller components. In some cases, you have to actually build it on site, uh, which can be very costly, much more expensive on installation. 
Dirty plants for high coating quality uh, requirements. We said, you know, the best solution for that is separating and isolating the coating process from a surrounding environment. And those are, that requires things like environmental control rooms for the powder application, possibly a new building uh, if you can't really separate it uh, because the, nothing good happens to a part after you clean it, only bad things. So uh, after the pretreatment system, once it exits that, if there's a lot of dirt and contamination in the air, it's going to go out to that part before it even gets to the coating operation, which is environmental control. Uh, building construction limitations, uh, you know, may require building modifications or prevent building modifications from occurring. Like we said, dig in a trench. Uh, uh, product design issues uh, may require special handling and coating techniques. Uh, new utility construction is very expensive. So if you don't have the utilities in-house, uh, having somebody pull a gas line to your plant utility may not be practical. Very stringent air uh, emission limits reduce your coating options. Certainly powder coatings meet those options. But if you're looking at a technology that requires, let's say, an e-coat primer or a powder primer and a liquid top coat, you're going to look at restricted coating options that affect that. And a local authority with jurisdiction issues often require expensive solutions. And that those solutions can be interpretive, uh, mainly because sometimes the local authority with jurisdictions aren't, although they, they should be focused on, uh, you know, uh, actual specific codes, sometimes they kind of wing it. So we want to make sure we, accom uh, we accommodate that. So with that, those are the specifics and generalities on how one gets through right sizing a powder coating operation, figuring out what plant specific issues impact that design, and also figure out how coating performance impacts coating design. We're gonna take a look at on a real world situation right now, an actual feasibility study on the, on the results of those, uh, uh, those specific inputs that go into finishing design, look at some uh, options for finishing design to accomplish those goals, and then, of course, compare and contrast those options, see which one or which ones in plural uh, may uh, be uh, entertained to move forward to, towards bid. So in this case, this is a real world situation. This is an actual uh, feasibility study that we perform for a client. So these are the inputs to the feasibility study in some real general terms. Uh, one, uh, they were only looking at powder coating. Uh, so that, that was pretty simple. Uh, they figured they had a color change uh, had to occur uh, in a, about 15 times uh, per shift. So we had that as an input. We had to accommodate something more than 24 colors in total. Uh, all parts received mostly one coat, possible two coats for uh, certain appearance properties, a, a top coat, clear coat combination, basically, for things like chrome lookalikes that was being evaluated. But in most case, one coat for performance is all that was required. Uh, but two coats were necessary to get certain looks that weren't available in a single coat operation. Uh, we were gonna evaluate different methods of cleaning and converting the substrates they were using. Uh, the substrates, by the way, were aluminum and stainless steel in this case. Uh, coating performance had to meet or exceed current performance standards. They've been doing this for quite a while and had products in the field that certainly wanted to be as good if not better than what they currently were delivering to the marketplace. Obviously, uh, we said aluminum and stainless steel was a substrate. Uh, production will be run in batches, and these are Kanban batches, basically. Uh, and basically, that means that, hey, we're going to batch up a bunch of products and run them, uh, similar products together and of the same color. So it wasn't, and that's important consideration when you're looking at a feasibility study, uh, inputting into, especially into a production analysis how the products are delivered to the line. As we said, uh, the paint line has to accommodate what's around it. So if fabrication can produce products in batches, in Kanban batches, then that means the finishing system should handle those same kind of batches and deliver it to assembly the same way. However, if production is handled in things like one piece flow, where products come off work cells in all different timelines and hit the paint line with no particular or in a very random method, no particular order, uh, the paint line has to handle it that way uh, unless you decide to accumulate it ahead of the paint line and put it into batches that you could run. And then the third approach is kits. Some people produce products in kits, and a kit basically is all the components that go into a, into a particular assembly. 
and they want to be able to organize the parts going through the paint line in that kit. So they deliver a kit of parts to the assembly operation uh, to assemble it up to their product. And in that case, they, they may be uh, uh, fabricated in Kanban batches or one piece flow, but they organize it before loading it on the line into a kit. In this case, for this particular client, uh, they want to use batches, uh, and that would be uh, Kanban batches. Um, the estimated annual units uh, were reflecting 2024 volume, so they were already had some extra headroom in there, uh, and then we had to put some uh, future growth beyond that. And of course, they wanted to use automation as much as, uh, as much as possible in the process and were appropriate. And, and that's important to, uh, to look at, especially for high volume applications. And that this is one of those. Okay, so what were the coding design options that are available to meet this particular client's requirements? Let's take a look at those. The current method of operation was to use either stainless steel or aluminum, as we said, as a substrate. They applied what was called a dried in place, not a dip. <laughs> dip stands for dried in place, not an immersion process. Uh, so they applied a dried in place sealer onto that uh, substrate surface after cleaning it. And then a single top coat met their performance requirements, which we estimated around 2000 hours salt spray on aluminum uh, and uh, to a number six uh, scribe performance requirements. So that was our target goal. And so we looked at option number one. And option number one uh, was to first off, of course, look at this method, uh, the current method, and also look at an alternative, something that's maybe a little bit more robust, a little bit more performance, and give them a little bit more flexibility on the materials used in the process. Same substrate, in this case, aluminum. Um, the product was clean, and a conversion coating would be applied to improve its corrosion protection. A dry and place sealer was still being used, especially. Uh, would be using this application, especially for stainless steel to improve from uh, adhesion, promote adhesion. And again, a single top coat would be also used uh, uh, as before. Now this package would meet something around 4,000 hours, something greater than 4,000 hours actually, on this aluminum substrate to the same uh, scribe performance requirements. Okay, number six rating. Then we looked at the two coat process in this case, mainly because two coats gave them some appearance options they didn't previously have. And we'll talk about that as we get to another slide. Uh, so we looked at this, you know, what is the performance of a two coat process? Again, the same uh, substrate uh, used, uh, aluminum in this case, uh, converted coating uh, uh, on that aluminum, a dry place sealer uh, to improve adhesion and, and corrosion protection. Mainly again, dry place sealer used to promote adhesion on stainless steel. Uh, top coat was applied to give it its basic uh, appearance, and a clear coat was applied on top of the top coat to improve the mechanical performance of that top coat. So things like uh, uh, chrome lookalikes, we'll see how that works here. So we looked at this package, and this package actually provides well over 6,000 hour salt spray protection. The only difference, again, is adding additional coating and powder in this case. So you basically end up with three pretreatment options uh, before us. One is the current performance about 2,000 hours. Uh, what we kind of called good pretreatment, which gets you to about 4,000 hours salt spray protection. A better about 5,000 hours salt spray protection. That's where uh, you know, we can make a little change on that. We'll explain what that was. And then uh, we went to the best pretreatment, uh, which was 6,000 hours when you, uh, when you put on the, um, uh, use the method that was applied here. So here's how that worked out and how it applied, as we said, you know, your performance affects process steps. So here we're just looking at the conversion, cleaning conversion process, what's often referred to as pretreatment. Okay, so we have several options here uh, and it depends upon which method. The current one would use an acid wash, that's why we say acid or alkaline, but the first one we're showing here is acid. You would acid wash it, why would you use acid? Because the substrate's aluminum, you need to etch that aluminum oxide off that surface. And then you follow it by a rinse. In this case, they had multiple rinses uh, in their current operation. And then that dried in place sealer would be applied at the very end to improve its corrosion performance and adhesion of the substrate uh, uh, to the powder coating. So uh, that's the current method. Uh, an option to that would be using uh, the same acid wash and going through a rinse, a DI rinse, preparing it for a good zirconium conversion coating, as we said, to improve performance and, and 
process flexibility. Then DI rinse it again and then apply that same dry in place sealer to promote that good adhesion to stainless steel. And we call that a good pretreatment. And then now we diverge and go from an acid wash that does all the etching and we go to an alkaline wash for the next two options. And we go to an alkaline wash because that's specifically designed just to remove organic soils. And that happens first and we go through a rinse. And now we still need an acid etch to remove those oxides on aluminum substrates. So that's a separate step here in this case. Uh, then we add a rinse. Uh, then we add a dry, uh, excuse me, a, a DI rinse afterwards to prepare it for a zirconium conversion right here. And then we add a uh, DI rinse and then have the dried in place sealer uh, towards the end. Uh, and then uh, uh, the last one uh, we call the best system. We basically added an extra rinse here. It's the same as the previous process. We just made sure since we have an alkaline wash and an acid etch, we just added an extra rinse here to make sure there's no alkaline contamination of the acid etch. So um, basically the big difference between uh, the good designs and current design uh, is yeah, taking uh, this dry in place sealer as being the only uh, uh, adhesion and corrosion barrier and breaking it up into two steps, having this, uh, a zirconium conversion and a separate sealer and getting some better performance. The difference between good and better was to say, we're gonna break up instead of just having an acid wash, which would not only clean the organic soils, but also remove the inorganic oxides, we would break them up into two stages, have an alkaline wash and an acid etch. Okay, one for inorganic soils, one for organic soils. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> the other way around. Organic soils here, inorganic soils there. Uh, and then this one, the last one, was just adding an extra rinse to make it uh, uh, easier to operate uh, in process management. I'll go from that and now we look at the two code option uh, on that affected design we said two code option only applied to uh very uh, uh specific to achieve a very specific look on a product things like hammer tones shown here that's uh or, or this is also another kind of hammer tone tinted clears fall in that category uh chrome look-alike powders fall in that category pearls fall in that category these are products that have a very nice very high uh, appearance uh, uh, requirement, but they have, to get that appearance, they don't really bring along with them very good mechanical performance, like scratch resistance or hardness. So the only way to make them work in this particular application is to put a clear coat on top, okay? And the clear coat on top is just to make these, these special uh, uh, finishes, if you will, uh, 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 achieve the mechanical and chemical performance required for this application. And that's what made it a two coat process. Okay, so now we have a one and two coat process and how's that shown here graphically, quite simply. Uh, we load uh, carriers in this case for products and we uh, uh, chemically pre-treat it. That was the steps talked in the previous slide. We dry it off, we cool it. And on a one coat process, we would powder coat it, cure it and cool it and unload it. On a two coat process, we would powder coat it, the base coat. We gel coat that, or gel cure, or what's called B stage cure. Uh, basically flow that base coat, uh, then cool it, then apply a clear top coat, and then go through a full cure, which would co-cure the base coat, or in this case, the top coat and the clear coat, uh, to fully cure the package, then cool it, and then unload it. So the difference between a one and two coat operation is a second application here, the clear here, and the gel oven, uh, and the cooling operation. Those are the three specific steps that are required to execute this particular two code process. And now you can see how coding performance, in this case, appearance would affect system design. Number of steps, more steps require more equipment. Uh, the next big thing uh, that needed to be evaluated for this client is how we're gonna convey the products through the process. Uh, we found uh, as, as time has gone on that this has been uh, you know, an area we spend a lot more time on uh, than in past uh, uh, situations. In this case, it's some very long products. They have 10 foot products and we can look at it either running horizontally to show them some small parts running horizontally or you can run them vertically. So that was the first option we had to look at. Well, if you look at now vertical and horizontal hanging being thrown in the mix, how many options are we looking at? Well, we're looking at 12 of them. Basically, we have uh, either horizontal or vertical hanging. Now, each one of those are split up and end up one or two coats, right? 
And then we got the good, better, best pretreatments, three pretreatments. So three pretreatments times two coatings times two hanging methods gives us 12 options. And so those are the options that are evaluated in this study. This is how we uh, got the system configured to understand what our technical options are. Okay, so what are the inputs into the right sizing for this particular client? Uh, the production information is provided by them, as we said, for 2024 volumes, uh, 15 minutes, or excuse me, 15 times a shift, we were going to actually uh, perform a color change. The way we were going to configure the process, we were going to do color change in a parallel booth, so there was really no lost production time, and it was going to be taking 10 minutes to do that color change offline because of the equipment that was being selected. Uh, we estimated something less than 1% for rejects and contingency. An additional 5% capacity over 20 years, 20 working years, by the way, was looked at. Uh, the system would operate 250 working days, one shift a day, seven hours a shift. Uh, we want a 99% uptime. Uh, parts were loaded on carriers and hangers, sized for the largest parts along the line. It could be run vertical or horizontally. We looked at both. Uh, on a horizontal system, the carrier is sized in, uh, in in uh, uh, millimeters because the client was a European client with a U.S. operation, and uh, this was the dimensions that we were using. Uh, the vertical parts were taking the same dimensions as putting in a vertical method. As you can see, what was now what was the length horizontally now becomes the height and vertical, uh, and, and that's how that worked out. The width is the same, and uh, 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 these dimensions aren't the same because we just configure the parts in a different window. Uh, the density would be about 73%. Uh, on the line, and that's the number of parts per, per window area. And um, the hangers uh, were spaced uh, uh, either eight inches on a vertical method or 24 inches between the hangers on the horizontal methods for line speed calculation. Uh, and so for uh, horizontal product hanging, we'll look at that first. And here's the production analysis results. This is the actual summary from our math model. And you can see we have all the proper inputs. This is just a summary. What's behind here is a lot of information. This client had 1,700 different part SKUs going through this process. That's 1,700 different part configurations. And that's all happening in the background. This is all the summary page. So here's our in time inputs, 420 minutes a shift, one shift a day, 250 per year. There's the calculation for the available time. It's result. Uh, where you have no loss of color change time uh, uh, because that's happening offline. We are doing 15 minutes, uh, excuse me, 15 color changes per shift. We have that 1% reject here, that's 1.0%. It looks like 10 was really 1.0. We have a 5% additional production factor, uh, not for uh, a five year period, by the way. We just added 5% because I already projected out to 124. We have the part window information here. Here's the part window that we have to fill with the parts the space in between the windows and the density we're shooting for. And those are the inputs to the analysis, the math model. The outputs are shown below. And uh, line speed and feet per minute came out to be eight feet per minute. That's the most salient one. Since this was a carrier-based system, we also wanted to track how many carriers, in this case, 40 carriers per hour, giving us one and a half minutes per carrier uh, to operate. The other good information you get from this kind of analysis is important information for procuring equipment. And it's things like uh, uh, gross weight and, and gross square footage. So we're going to skip through this and uh, move on and run a little faster here. So the production analysis showed that we're going to run 40 carriers an hour, like we said. Uh, and since we have uh, a loading restrictions here, we have about 100 parts we have to load. Uh, we have three stops, two people accommodating that, giving us about 4.8 seconds per part. That's the big difference between loading horizontal versus vertical and therefore a power-free conveyor is the only solution. So we look at vertical hanging. Well, vertical hanging is a little bit different. Uh, we end up with a 5.2 foot per minute line speed based upon all the inputs. And that allowed us to make the window much smaller. So now we only needed two stations, two people each, and still give us 3.9 seconds per part. You can still get the, a, a much reduced number of parts in that space because this part window uh, uh, went from 10 foot long to something much narrower, okay? Uh, therefore, the line speed was better because everything's one, the, long, the longest dimension is running vertically. Still the same number of products going through the process and wait per hour. So how does this impact? What's the compare and contrast? Those are the two big remarkable differences, vertical versus horizontal, and all compared to baseline. So here's how we compare it, baseline. 
We compared uh, uh, current to uh, future designs, both horizontal and vertical hanging methods. Uh, we looked at floor space impact, operating costs, staffing, productivity, which is uh, through cost and capital investment. And here's, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this because you're gonna see this uh, uh, you know, anytime you want, but here's the basic one, takes about 11 people to run. And for a two code operation, horizontal is 19, two code operation, verticals 15, these are 13 and 17 for one coats. Uh, so it's a good way to compare and contrast in a simple methodology. All right, with that. Total floor space, same thing. We have impact of current versus future, and we have total floor space showing for one coat horizontal, one coat uh, vertical, much less floor space because everything is much more compact. Okay, and two coats also shown there. Annual operating costs. Eh, this is where we start seeing some things uh, a little different. We actually save some operating costs on one coat in the future and uh, one coat in the future vertical versus horizontal. We saved operating costs, uh, but the two coat operation mainly because of materials, which is shown in this slide. The material cost is the most impact between one coat, two coat. That makes sense. We're putting two coats of powder on it. That's uh, uh, made that much more costly to operate. And a capital cost by design. Everything was more expensive than a current operation. And this is shown here as being approximately uh, 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 $6 million versus about $5 million for one coat horizontal. But the vertical operation was much less expensive, closer to $5 million. Okay, two coats were also more expensive because the additional equipment required. And this capital equipment was mainly shown by component here. And you can see the two coat up. Well, first off, you can see horizontal required power and free, and that conveyor option is a red line. That was the most expensive component you're buying. All the rest of the things, the ovens and stuff, weren't, weren't that, that much. They were pretty similar. When you go from one coat to two coat, of course, having a second booth and a second oven, that was what made these lines uh, uh, really shoot out there for that capital impact. So one coat is shown as less expensive to buy, of course. So when you compare to baseline, if uh, the baseline is uh, 4,700 square, or, or, uh, this was actually annualized. So this is the, uh, the floor space by design. This is your baseline and what's the, the impact of newer designs. Newer designs are shown in blue above. It's a good way to show the impact of the different uh, uh, solutions here. Capital cost, same thing. This is the one most people want to spend time on. If, if this is the baseline, what's the premium I'm paying? for my different technical options. Well, on the horizontal system, the premium is mainly focused on the conveyance operation, and that's the premiums paid. Since this is uh, doesn't have that premium uh, on the vertical, excuse me, on the horizontal line, excuse me, this is a vertical line. On the vertical line, uh, it, it's cap, uh, capex impact is minor. Uh, the two coat ones are these other ones, and that's obvious, you know, more equipment requires more capital. And operating costs, same thing. Those that are applying two coats are more expensive to operate compared to current. Those are applying one coat, we can operate them actually less expensively than current because of certain uh, uh, efficiencies gained by the new process design. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly uh, to see what kind of questions we may have. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, um, we did get a question in. This was a, a little bit ago when you were talking um, about the uh, curing and, and things of that sort. Um, would pre-gelling with infrared or electric source be advisable before convection drying? Um, pre -cure, uh, yeah, infrared boosting systems can be used uh, in many applications to shorten the overall cure time and pre-gel the part and prevent powder from blowing off in a convection oven. And what you have to worry about with infrared technology is whether it's applicable to your parts and what makes it applicable to your parts. Infrared technology is light energy that basically heats the surface of the part or the coating on the surface of the part. So you have to make sure, first off, um, that, so don't, that light only travels in a straight line. So basically, you have to make sure those areas that you want to cure actually can see the light energy. Mm -hmm. So can the emitters be spaced around the part and, and put enough energy in it to get that uh, gel melt and flow to occur prior to going to cure oven. If it can, it can be a very effective way of shortening, shortening that piece of equipment down and uh, reducing the um, risk of blowing the, part, uh, the powder off the part. 
Any other questions? Yeah, we sure do. Um, this is a pretreatment um, issue. Do you see zirconium pretreatment in addition to alkaline cleaning very often? And if so, do you believe it is necessary? Uh, there's one thing that's absolutely clear in the powder coating process. Uh, you have to have a clean surface to apply the coating to. Now, what conversion coating, if any, in this case, zirconium was the question uh, that you add, is all about uh, improving adhesion and improving corrosion performance. So that's why uh, you, you apply the zirconium. Now, why would we separate um, the cleaning operation from the uh, conversion operation? You don't have to. Uh, they, there, there are what are systems called cleaner coders out there, uh, where you can both clean and convert the surface of substrate in one stage. Those are typically three-stage washers. And those are also available in zirconium technology and have been for some time. Uh, it can make the equipment smaller. Uh, but now you're asking, it's called a combination stage. You're asking for that combination stage to do two operations, not only clean the part, but also convert it. And conversion coatings aren't developed on a dirty surface. So if you have 90 seconds in that, com in that combination stage, and it takes uh, uh, 80 seconds of that 90 seconds to clean the part, uh, then you only have 10 seconds left to actually convert it. And you may not get enough or sufficient conversion coating or zirconium uh, on the substrate uh, to provide the performance you're looking for. Uh, you may have products that come in with a variety of different soils that may take more effort in cleaning. Uh, uh, it's much more difficult to adjust a combination stage to accommodate that on-the-fly uh, change in soil load. Uh, if you have separate stages, you have a, a much easier time. You can run your cleaner at a much higher concentration uh, or a higher concentration uh, to handle stubborn soils without affecting the conversion uh, uh, application at all. So separate dedicated stages have offer more flexibility for incoming soils and product performance uh, and, and sometimes manageability as well of the process. Doesn't mean it's the wrong way of going, there's just two options. Okay. Kelly? Yeah, so um, one last question here before we close out. For a vertical system, is there a way to accommodate 12 foot and three foot length batches? Uh, yes, uh, uh, vertical systems have been designed uh, uh, in the powder coating industry to accommodate products up to 24 foot long. Those are vertical extrusion lines. And 24 foot long, when you think about it, is really like the size of a three-story building. <laughs> it, it presents some unique technical challenges, but it can be done, no doubt. Uh, so yes, we, you, you can hang uh, uh, parts, even in batches, uh, 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 vertically, as long as you want, as long as you got a way to reach it, to hang it, okay? And you got a way to uh, reach it if you're doing batch applications, such as manual application of either coatings or cleaning agents. Can you reach that or hit the part after it's been hung vertically? Okay. Well, great. Uh, a lot of great information, Nick. Thank you so much. Um, if you wouldn't mind just flipping through the last couple slides with me real quick before we say goodbye to everyone. Um, sure, my pleasure. Guess... Thank you for, for the audience attendance. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah. I know there's some slides I breeze through pretty quickly. Um, but I wanted to focus on the technical aspects of how you get there than the results. Exactly. Great. And uh, yes, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, PCI just announced the dates for our powder, powder coating week 2022. They will be March 7th through 9th. And we're going back to the Renaissance Orlando at SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida. So watch for more details to be announced in the coming weeks for that. Um, and we do want to just remind everybody to please watch for that link to the survey and give us your feedback. Um, you will also get a link as soon as we have the recording available online. So uh, you'll be able to, to check through this again and, and let us know if you have any further questions. And then Nick, the last slide there, um, if you wanna leave that up for a minute, you can send any additional questions or comments to the executive director of PCI, that's Kevin Corson. His email address is kevin at powdercoating.org. So thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.